Good afternoon. I'm Michael Munson, FORGE's Executive Director. Thank you for joining us today as we are discussing sheltering transgender men. Some of the webinars are geared towards more advanced topics, while others are more basic. Today's webinar is going to be a hybrid of both some Transgender 101 materials, as well as talking more in specific uh, details about sheltering transgender men. If you'd like to know more in-depth information about 101 materials, the FORGE website has many additional 101 training materials specifically designed for victim service providers and allied professionals. Our website address is forge-forward.org, which is also at the bottom of every slide in today's webinar. Before we get started, many of you uh, who have been on one of FORGE's webinars or in our in-person trainings have seen this slide, so please do whatever it is that you need to do to take care of yourself today during this webinar and throughout the day and your work life too. We know that work, the work that you do is hard and we recognize that listening to training materials can sometimes tap into feelings that might be overwhelming or just difficult. We also know that many of you are also either on call or might be pulled away from your, your desk with an in-person crisis or an urgent matter. So please know that the webinar is being recorded and that you can come back to it at any time um, you'd like that you have more time. Please know and follow your heart and take care of yourself in the best way that you need to. Today's well, webinar, as well as uh, the over 50 webinars of 50 archived webinars that are on our website, are made possible by the Office on Violence Against Women. We are continuing uh, to be grateful for their can, their support in allowing us to bring trans-focused materials to you. Let me start off by telling you a little bit about who FORGE is, just to give you a framework of, of who's presenting today. FORGE is a transgender organization that is 100% funded to focus on anti-violence issues related to transgender and non-binary survivors of sexual assault, domestic and dating violence, and stalking. As some of you might know, FORGE began in 1994 specifically to provide support and community for transmasculine individuals and loved ones. So this webinar on trans men and shelter ties us back to our roots of who we initially served when we started. We've come a long way since 1994 when we provided local and regional support. Now, although our, our work is headquartered in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, almost all of our work is national. Approximately 75% of our time focuses on working with victim service providers, providing training and technical assistance. The remaining 25% of our time and effort is spent directly working with trans and non-binary survivors and loved ones. Our role as technical assistance provider has allowed us to directly see uh, key continued and emerging challenges many agencies are experiencing in serving survivors of all genders. Our work is rooted in two foundational principles being trauma-informed and empowerment-focused in all the work that we do, both with survivors and with victim service professionals. We are also guided by research and evidence-based strategies, but are highly aware that when working with marginalized populations, sometimes the most successful solutions are charting new territory and creating new best practices. We have a long history of correct crafting dynamic, in-person, remote access, and print-based training materials in ways that are highly accessible to people of many different service provisions, as well as many different learning levels and learning styles. We're here to support you in the work that you do to support um, and work with trans and non-binary survivors. Some of what we can offer you are, like I mentioned before, the 50 um, or more hours of archived webinar trainings fact and tip sheets that are fairly quick reference guides for anybody to use and pick up easily, longer versions of written materials that provide more in-depth information, guides for trans survivors and loved ones, and direct one-on-one -on -one technical assistance and on-request training. We also support you in working with trans clients by having an active presence on three social media platforms. We encourage you to like and follow us so that we can share trans-focused work with you and so we can connect with you and learn from each other. You can find us on Facebook, 
Twitter, and Instagram. And if you're live tweeting today as you watch, we encourage you to use the hashtag TransShelter and tag us in your posts. On today's webinar, you'll be hearing more from me, Michael Munson, Forge's Executive Director and Primary Trainer, as well as Laurie Cook-Daniels, Forge's Policy and Program Director and Main Writer. Although Ashley is not on our webinar today, we wanted to highlight her here to show that we have a new staff person and you'll be seeing more of her in the future webinars. We're really glad that you're here with us today and let's get going into our, our main content. So today, we're going to help frame who trans men are by going over a few details about who and what trans men are. We'll then look at three types of shelter, both sex segregated and gender integrated, as well as alternatives to those two types of, of shelters. We'll move on to discussing some of the variables that are going to be true across all types of shelters, including confronting bias and creating an environment of respect. We'll end with some resources and reminders. So who are trans men? To help us all be on the same page, we'd like to spend a little bit of time focusing on who transgender men are. For some of you, we know this is going to be a review, and for others, it might be new information. In 2016, more and more people were talking about trans issues. In a groundbreaking speech in conjunction with Attorney General Loretta Lynch, Vanita Gupta, head of the Civil Rights Division, very succinctly said, transgender men are men. They live, work, and study as men. As we focus today on trans men, we're referring to the people who identify as men, who have or want to transition to living as male. These men were assigned female at birth, but are now living as male or identifying as male. We know that people don't fall into neat divisions or categories or boxes. Trans men and transmasculine people come in all shapes, sizes, colors, abilities, ages, and more. Some are indistinguishable from other men, and others are often mistakenly thought to be women. Some desire to medically transition through the use of hormones or surgery, and some do not. Some present as male all the time, and some do not, for a huge variety of reasons. Many use the pronouns he and him, which will be used during this webinar, but some do not. Trans men are every bit as diverse and varied as non-trans men in terms of who they are, how they express themselves, who they form relationships with, and more. We want to be very clear from the beginning that trans men are just one segment of the trans community. This webinar is one of three focusing on transgender people and shelter. The other two highlight trans women and non-binary individuals. These three subgroups of the trans population, trans women, trans men, and non-binary individuals, cannot capture the fullness of identities and experiences that trans people embody. We're making these distinctions because we know that the majority of you will be encountering trans people that fall into one of these large and diverse groups. We also trust that you will, like you do with every survivor, treat each person as an individual, unique in their history, their story, their experiences, and their needs. So how many men, trans men, are there? We don't know exactly how many trans people there are, since not everyone would identify themselves as trans on a survey or in the census. Similarly, the studies that have been done all have different determinants for who is trans and who's not. The Williams Institute out of, the UC, out of UCLA estimates that 0.6% of the population is transgender. Other researchers like Lynn Conway and many others calculate that 1% is probably a more accurate number. Approximately half of trans people are assigned male at birth and half of trans people are assigned female at birth. The National Center for Transgender Equality just released the results of the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey. Of their amazing 27,000 respondents, 29% identified as transgender men. So to do a little bit of math, if we take the total U.S. population, which is around 318 million, multiply it by that 1% that's trans, and then we multiply it by 29% that the U.S. Trans Survey says are trans men, we end up with just under 1 million Americans who identify as transgender men. 
trans men may take social, medical, or legal steps to live more authentically. Not all trans men transition, but a substantial number do transition to living and presenting as male in the world. The U.S. Transgender Survey reported that 82% of men have transitioned and 16% want to transition someday. These numbers are substantially higher than for trans women, with trans women being 68% um, stating that they have a desire to transition. I'm sorry, stating that they've, they have transitioned. Let me briefly share with you some information about social, medical, and legal actions that trans men may take. Let's start with socially. So socially, like Vanita Gupta said, trans men are men. They live, work, and study as men. This isn't always true, but many men, trans men, are living their day-to-day -day lives as men. This often means that trans men have come out and have transitioned with family and friends in their work or school environments, with their religious or faith communities, with their acquaintances or more other more casual relationships. Medically, many trans men use hormones, most often testosterone. Hormone use is highly correlated with economic status and access to health care, even though many insurance providers still routinely deny coverage of hormones. Trans men are more likely to have had some form of transition-related surgery than trans women or non-binary individuals. The U.S. Transgender Surgery Survey indicated that 42% of trans men have had some form of trans-related surgery versus 28% of trans women. Legally, like access to medical care and services, economics may influence the ability for trans men to legally change their name or to make changes to their identity documents. More than 35% of trans people could not afford to legally change their name. More than two-thirds, or 68%, of the U.S. Transgender Survey respondents did not have ID, any ID that reflected both the name and gender they preferred. When showing ID that does not match their presentation, 32% reported negative experiences, such as being harassed, denied services, or being attacked. Remember that regardless of what actions a trans man takes or doesn't take, it does not change his identity or validity as a man. To end this section, the following quote is from Ian Harvey, a transgender man actor um, who has played the role on the Amazon TV series Transparent. He states, far too much importance is placed on looking the part in our culture. And it's upsetting to me when people use that as a qualifier to decide whether or not someone's identity is real. All you have to do to be real is to open your mouth and identify who you are. I am who I say I am. No matter what my body may visually tell the world, it's not up for the public to debate. A couple of other parameters that we wanted to, to set as we um, head into the, the sheltering section and the, the data is we wanted to make sure that um, you knew that we were talking about primarily adults in this webinar. We know that those who are under the age of 18 may have access to different types of shelter and services, as well as often face um, different kinds of barriers than adults do. We also want to recognize that trans survivors of intimate partner violence needing shelter may be undocumented or may live on tribal lands. The scope of this webinar will not address some of the specific unique challenges impacting those survivors. And again, I'd like to remind you that the portraits that we've painted here, and in the case examples we'll discuss today, that we are only touching on a fraction of the complexity and the beauty of trans men. There is a wide variation in who is, is trans and who are trans men, and there's absolutely no way to capture the rich diversity within the short time that we have today. Trans men experience high rates of victimization in many areas of their lives. While it's important to look at the broad picture of who trans men are and the challenges trans men face, we're going to stay focused in this webinar on intimate partner violence and sexual assault within intimate relationships. Data is somewhat limited on transgender people who experience specific types of victimization. 
when Forge looked at the impact of childhood sexual abuse, adult sexual assault, dating violence, domestic violence, and stalking in our 2011 research, we found that around 50% of, of trans men experienced childhood sexual abuse, 31% experienced adult sexual assault, 23% experienced dating violence, while 36% experienced domestic violence. And we were also surprised to find that 18% of trans men experienced stalking in their lifetime. A 2015 meta-analysis by the Williams Institute reported that of all vectors of trans people, between 31 and 50% experienced intimate partner violence in their lifetime, and between 25 and 47% of intimate partner um, sexual assaults uh, occurred within their lifetime. Of these studies, they examined um, one that looked at trans men specifically. In this one study by Terrell in 2000, um, they found that 43% of trans men reported intimate partner violence over the course of their lifetime, and 28% had noted intimate partner sexual assault in their lifetime. Similar findings were confirmed in the recent US transgender survey 2015, reporting that 54% of their large sample of trans people had experienced some form of intimate partner violence. So Larie, could you take us through the next section? Thank you, Michael. Historically, the majority of domestic violence shelters have been sex segregated and accessible only to non-trans women and their young children. This has often meant that survivors who are men, trans and non-trans men alike, have been grossly underserved. We'll talk in another webinar about the implications for people who do not identify as male or female, but who may identify as non-binary, gender non-conforming, or multiply gendered. Even though most shelters still serve only women, there are new federal mandates that require agencies to provide equal or comparable services to all survivors of all genders. Federal laws, though, aren't the only reason shelters are working hard to house and provide services to people of all genders. Many shelters have come to recognize that it is, quite simply, the right thing to do. We realize that for many of you listening, you might feel challenged by how to move forward to creating shelter environments that are welcoming to people of all genders. We hope that this is one of many resources that will help you better serve transgender men. We recognize there are many different types of shelters. We recognize, too, that larger cities tend to have more options for shelter than smaller or rural communities. We also recognize that survivors may have preferences and needs for specific types of shelter that may or may not be currently offered in specific geographic areas. We're going to focus our examples and discussion today on three broad categories of shelter. One is women-only shelters, communal living. Men-only shelters exist, but they are almost exclusively designed for homeless individuals versus those who have experienced IPV. We'll also talk about gender-integrated shelters, which are communal living, often designed for families. The third is alternative shelters, apartments, hotels, non-communal structures, in-community options, and other arrangements. We'll circle back and talk in more detail about each type later in the webinar. It's important to remember some of the details about the Violence Against Women's Act's non-discrimination conditions when determining how to shelter and provide services to trans men. If your agency receives funds from the Office on Violence Against Women, this section is particularly applicable to you. The Violence Against Women Reauthorization Act of 2013, which President Obama signed on March 7, 2013, amends the 1994 Violence Against Women Act by adding a grant condition that prohibits discrimination by recipients of certain Department of Justice funds. It says, quote, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of actual or perceived race, color, religion, national origin, sex, gender identity, as defined in paragraph 
249C4 of Title 18 United States Code, sexual orientation or disability be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any program or activity funded in whole or in part with funds made available under VAWA and any other program or activity funded in whole or in part with funds appropriated for grants, cooperative agreements, and other assistance administered by the Office on Violence Against Women. In April 2014, the U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Justice Programs, Office for Civil Rights, issued a concise 11-page frequently asked questions document that addresses this change. It's available at the URL at the top of this slide. If you have not read this really brief and very non-legalese document, we strongly encourage you to do so. It outlines far more than we will cover today and is a and it is critically important for all shelter staff to know about. Because the new non-discrimination provision prohibits OVW-funded shelters from excluding, denying services to, or discriminating against people on the basis of actual or perceived sex or gender identity, shelters that provide sex-specific services for women or for men must integrate transgender people into those services unless the trans person requests something different, particularly as it relates to their safety. Since many shelters are for women only, we wanted to point out a few additional segments of the Frequently Asked Questions document. The document explains that although shelters may be sex segregated, they must determine that sex segregation is, quote, necessary to the essential operation of a program, unquote. DOJ expects shelters to support this justification with, quote, an assessment of the facts and circumstances surrounding the specific program and take into account established best practices and research findings as applicable, unquote. Factors that may be relevant to this assessment include the nature of the service, the anticipated positive and negative consequences to all eligible beneficiaries, meaning survivors, of not providing the program in a sex-segregated or sex-specific manner, the literature on the efficacy of the service being sex-segregated or sex-specific, the impact on transgender individuals seeking services, and whether similarly situated recipients, in other words, agencies, providing the same services have been successful in providing services effectively in a manner that is not sex segregated or sex specific. Notably, justification for sex segregation cannot rely on unsupported assumptions or overly broad sex-based generalizations. And an agency may not provide sex segregated or sex specific services for reasons that are trivial or based solely on the agency's convenience. Forge has worked with and learned of many shelters who have successfully integrated and served trans men at their facilities. It's possible and not difficult. If a shelter program decides to continue operating as a sex-segregated sex facility, it is important to keep in mind that the VAWA non-discrimination condition now requires the provision of comparable services to those who cannot be housed in the main sex-segregated facility with other survivors. The Department of Justice's Frequently Asked Questions document defines comparable this way, quote, a comparable service is one that is, I'm sorry, that is designed to confer a substantially equal benefit. Factors that DOJ will consider either individually or in the aggregate is appropriate in determining whether services are comparable include the following. The nature and quality of the services provided, the relative benefits of different therapeutic modalities or interventions, geographic location or other aspects of accessibility, the characteristics of the facility where services are provided, and the characteristics of the individual to provide the service. 
services need not be identical to be comparable, but they must be of the same or similar quality and duration. The new non-discrimination provisions, the cost of developing and running multiple service systems, and the continuing emergence of best practices in serving trans and non-binary survivors of IPV, sexual assault, dating violence, and stalking, all point to forge a strong recommendation that shelters move toward creating gender integrated services whenever possible. The criteria for placing trans men in shelter is very clear. A trans man's stated gender identity is all that is needed to place him in the men's section of a sex segregated shelter. Trans men may be reluctant to call and ask for emergency housing. They, like many others, often believe that shelter is only available to women, so may not reach out to see what options are available. If they do connect with your agency, the following sections will help guide you to better serving trans men. Keep in mind that gender is about how someone identifies, not how they look to other people. The Department of Justice's Frequently Asked Questions document offers this guidance. Quote, a shelter that operates a sex-segregated or sex-specific program should assign a survivor to the group or service that corresponds to the gender with which the survivor identifies, with the following considerations. In deciding how to house a victim, a shelter that provides sex-segregated housing may consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether a particular housing assignment would ensure the victim's health and safety. If there is a choice of a gendered facility or all gender shelter or space, ask the survivor which option he would prefer and feel safest to be housed in and respect his request. Remember, a trans man should not be asked about his body, for example, if he is taking hormones or if he has had surgery of any type, or other invasive questions, such as how long he has been living as a man or whether he presents as a man full time. Whichever housing request a trans man makes should be trusted as a choice that will keep him safest and most secure. As with all other survivors entering shelter, he should be believed and not required to produce burdensome documentation or asked invasive questions to prove who he is. Let's look at housing trans men based on the three different types of shelter we mentioned earlier. As we mentioned and as most of you know, the vast majority of domestic violence shelters have been women only. There are some shelters that are men only, but most often they are not designed for people who have experienced intimate partner violence, but rather for those who are homeless. When working with trans men, individuals who identify as men or as male, it is difficult to imagine a situation where a placement into a women-only shelter would be either appropriate or desired. We recognize that some transmasculine individuals may be early into their transition or have chosen to not take any transition steps. However, if they identify as men, placement into a women-only shelter both contradicts and disrespects their identity. There may be some cases, particularly when a trans man may be newly exploring his gender identity, that placement into a women's shelter might be appropriate. But keep in mind that identity is the driver for placement into sex segregated services. We strongly discourage placement or suggestion of placement into homeless shelters either sex segregated or gender integrated for individuals who are leaving relationships where there has been intimate partner abuse. Aside from the fact that homeless shelters are not designed to be secure, in other words, to prevent entry from abusing partners, and do not offer support services like groups, counseling, safety planning, and more, homeless shelters have layers of violence and abuse for transgender individuals. For example, of the trans people who were able to access homeless shelters, 44% left the shelter due to poor treatment or unsafe conditions. 
25% decided to dress or present as the wrong gender in order to feel safer, and 14% said that shelter staff forced them to dress or present as the wrong gender in order to stay in shelter. These numbers are from people who could get into shelter. A startling 74% of the individuals who were denied shelter were denied because of their gender identity or gender expression. In other words, homeless shelters are not a safe option for transgender men. Gender integrated shelters are likely the best option for most trans men. Housing that is already designed to include people of all genders is going to be a logical and smooth fit for the majority of men of trans experience. Not all cities or communities have gender integrated shelters, so other options may be, need to be explored if this type of housing option isn't available. If it is available, some specific concerns for trans men at gender integrated shelters include some of the following concerns. Since many shelters have shared rather than single rooms or a limited number of single or family housing options, many people will have a roommate. A trans man's shared room assignment in an all-gender shelter should be based on his self-identification and his own understanding of where he will be safest, not on his surgical status, his body, or documentation markers, the name or gender on his driver's license. Staff should discuss with him whether he is concerned about any safety issues, unnecessary hardships, or other concerns in placing him with a roommate. Since some shelters do have single rooms available for individuals who have medical or mental health conditions, sleep disorders, or disabilities, staff and residents may decide that a single room is the best option. Additional safety measures might include placement near the overnight staff desk or office to provide an added level of comfort. Whatever decision is made, it should be made with the full involvement of the trans survivor and should never be imposed upon him against his wishes. Gender integrated shelters may already be mindful of things like the colors of paint on the walls or other design elements that tend to be typically associated with one gender. One shelter we worked with noted, quote, we design the bedrooms so that they're not feminine oriented. We do that so that anyone can be comfortable there. The rooms are comfortable for people who are in a difficult circumstance. That's it. We partner with a quilting group who make the colorful quilts to be gender neutral on purpose. We also make lap throws, and the clients get to take them. We try to make it as much of a home as possible. Getting dressed may be more involved for some trans men than simply putting on their clothes. Some may need additional levels of privacy and time to get ready for their day. For example, some trans men will need to bind their chest and or adjust a packing device to achieve a more masculine appearance. Binders or chest compression shirts, packing devices, makeup to thicken the appearance of facial hair, and other devices are not optional or minor accessories. Rather, they help define trans men as men and allow them to present their body in alignment with their male gender identity. They also provide a level of safety from the disproportionate violence experienced by people who are seen as deviating from gender rules or gender norms. Disrobing at bedtime may also pose some unique challenges. For a trans man who is dependent on a binder or chest compression shirt, for example, he may be hesitant to take it off before bed if he is rooming with another resident. His binder may be a primary component of appearing masculine, and its removal may disclose his trans identity to his roommate or staff who see him without it. It's important to note that it is medically recommended to take breaks in binder wearing. Binders should not be worn 24-7 and can cause harm to a person's breathing, posture, and skin if worn continuously. If a trans man has had top surgery, he may have concerns about his roommate seeing the scars on his chest. This is similarly true if he has had genital surgery or any skin grafting for gender-related surgeries. 
When possible, shelters should consider incorporating room dividers in shared rooms to afford more privacy between beds and areas where residents may be disrobing. Dividers should be placed in all shared rooms so that all residents are treated equally. If dividers are provided only in a room housing a trans person, it may draw unneeded attention to him and may inadvertently disclose his trans history. One of the most discussed trans options for both trans and trans topics for both trans and non-trans people is bathrooms. In general, people enter restrooms to use the toilet, wash their hands, or check the mirror to make sure their appearance is the way they would like it to be. Gender-specific bathrooms are a source of stress for many transgender people. In recent data from the 2015 U.S. Transgender Survey, results indicate that 75% of trans men, sometimes or always, avoided public or semi-public bathrooms in the past year. A third of respondents avoided drinking or eating, so they would not need to use the restroom. Unfortunately, there is a pervasive myth that trans people pose a risk to non-trans people in bathrooms. The reality is that the people who are most often in danger when using public and semi-public restrooms are trans people themselves. But the myth is so pervasive that it may be one of the most difficult for shelter staff to dismantle. To help create an environment where everyone can use the restroom with minimal fear or danger, here are some easy suggestions. Have at least one gender-neutral bathroom. If you have sing single-stall bathrooms, it's easy to convert all of them to any gender bathrooms. Keep all bathrooms unassigned. In other words, don't put gendered signs on any bathroom door. Make sure that all bathrooms have locks. When bathrooms are sex-segregated, multi-stall, or multi-person, have signage that reminds all users that everyone has a right to use the bathroom and to, and to determine which bathroom aligns with their identity. Similar to bathrooms, shower privacy is important to most people. Like dressing and undressing, Trans men may have concerns about others seeing their binder, packing devices, chest, genitals, or scars. Bathrooms and shower areas that have locked doors or designed for single users are the best options for maintaining bodily privacy and increasing feelings of safety for trans men. If locks aren't possible, drapes or partitions can provide some level of privacy. One all-gender shelter recommend recommended having staff set the, it's not a problem tone. They said, in quote, integrating bathrooms has really been a non-issue because the agency treats it like it's a non-issue. If we treated the bathrooms like they were a big deal, then clients would pick up on that and make it an issue. It is common for any survivor to enter shelter with just the clothes on their back without the supplies and resources they may use every day. Many shelters do an excellent job of pro providing toiletries, clothing, and other needed supplies. Yet shelters that are relatively new to sheltering men may not realize just how much difference there is, not only between clothing intended for men and women, but also for such basic human necessities as soap. Trans men may also need supplies that are trans-specific and essential to presenting as male, as well as vital to their safety. Some of these items include clothes. Many trans men are smaller, wider through the hips and thighs, or otherwise have different body proportions than non-trans men. It's important to stock clothing designed for men in a variety of sizes, as well as clothing that is more unisex such as dark colored t-shirts and sweatpants. If your shelter has a section of professional clothes for job interviews, stock up on a variety of ties, blazers, and other types of dress apparel for men as well. Stock a wide variety of male underwear sizes and types, such as men's briefs, 
and boxers. Having a wide selection takes the pressure off of choosing from just a few, which may feel uncomfortable. Shoes. Many trans men wear smaller shoe sizes than non-trans men. Hats. Many trans men use hats to help them look and feel more aligned with their gender. Stock a wide variety of knit caps, baseball hats, and other hats. Toiletries. People of all genders have bodies that sweat and need cleaning. But personal hygiene products are often gender specific with different smells as well as different packaging for men or women. Be mindful of how toiletries are gendered and consider stocking scentless or fragrance-free products which are suitable for any gender and are also safer for people with chemical sensitivities. In addition, be sure to make condoms available to all men, including trans men. Razors and shaving cream. Trans and non-trans men often shave as part of their routine body care. Menstrual products. Some trans men have periods. It is important to have a variety of products available, including pads and tampons in different sizes. And make sure they are accessible to all residents in a private location. Binders. Many trans men who have not had chest or top surgery use binders or chest compression shirts to flatten their torso and give the appearance of a flatter chest. Having access to commercially made chest compression shirts can decrease serious health problems caused by homemade binders made out of ACE bandages or tape. Compression shirts might not be easily stocked since they are often expensive, highly personal, and body specific in terms of sizing. However, working with local trans and LGBT agencies can be a good way to acquire these products. Offering a wide variety of sports bras can also be a good temporary solution. A packing device, also known as a packer or packy, is a store-bought or homemade pant stuffer or prosthetic device used to create or augment a genital bulge, which many trans men find essential to appearing and feeling male. Again, partnering with trans or LGBT organizations can help in accessing these items. Stand to pee devices are items that make it possible for some trans men to urinate while standing. Like binders, these items are highly personal and body specific and thus may not be easily stocked. However, being prepared to help a trans man survivor obtain them is a good idea. Note that gender congruent clothing, toiletry, and appearance aids like binders are often extremely important to men of trans history. Not only can they make a trans man feel more comfortable in his own skin, but they provide safety in a world that can be very violent against people who are perceived to be breaking the gender roles. Although some men, non-trans and trans alike, may not be picky about their clothes, toiletries, etc., Asking or expecting trans men to wear clothing, shoes, or underwear styled for women or use products styled for women can cause psychological harm. One easy way a shelter can obtain most of these trans-friendly supplies is to put them on your donation list if you have one. When requesting donations, specifically ask for men's clothes and underwear, smaller sized men's shoes, baseball hats, knitted caps, and other hats, razors and shaving cream, gender neutral and unscented soaps and deodorants, binders, and chest compression shirts. Specifying that you are requesting these items to better serve trans men will also help your agency strengthen its reputation as a place that may be a safe option for transgender survivors. For other items that may not be so easy to obtain, Connecting with local and state transgender or LGBT organizations and asking for their help may be useful. Ideally, you would regularly have these items in stock. Because trans populations are fairly tight-knit, calling for a trans man's supplies when he is in shelter may disclose to people that he is there and put his confidentiality at risk. If you don't have a needed item on hand, a safer option is to keep gift cards or petty cash available for these supplies 
and help trans men obtain them once they are in shelter. In addition to getting trans-specific supplies stocked, outreach may allow agencies to better understand trans communities' needs, encourage working together on projects of shared interest, and help build relationships that can be essential for future partnerships, support, and trust. Building relationships with trans communities can also raise awareness of IPV among trans people and can show that your shelter and services are welcoming. We've discussed sex segregated and gender integrated shelter options, spending the most time detailing the unique needs for trans men in gender integrated shelter. It's possible that neither sex segregated nor gender integrated shelters are an appropriate option for some trans men. It's also possible that your area does not have the type of shelter that's needed. Safety is a major concern for anyone entering shelter. Trans men may not feel safe in sex segregated or gender integrated communal, communal living environments. Just as with any other survivor, discussion and decisions may be made to not have a survivor enter communal shelter. For some, this may be making as safe as possible arrangements to stay with non-abusing family members, working out a way to stay in, a, in an apartment, either as part of the shelter's program or independent of it, extended hotel vouchers, or other creative and safe options. The safest place for people leaving abusive relationships is often in shelters where there are other survivors and shelter staff to support healing and safety. But this is not always the safest option for every person, including many trans people. I'm going to pass it back to Michael now, who's going to talk about more things to keep in mind when sheltering trans men. Great. Thanks, Lurie. Whatever decision is made for the type of shelter, there are some universal steps all shelters or referring agencies should be aware of when working with trans men. Let's start with some of the um, perhaps obvious, perhaps not obvious things like names and pronouns. Knowing and using a person's name correctly is always important, regardless of the person's gender identity. This is particularly true of transgender people who often experience others refusing to use their correct name or using their former name on purpose as an abusive tactic. Correct pronouns are essential too. A best practice is for providers to share their own name and pronoun when introducing themselves and then invite survivors to share their own. For example, you could say, at our agency, we strive to treat everyone with respect and not make assumptions, so we ask everyone for their name and pronouns. My name is Jan, and I use the pronouns, um, the pronouns that I use for myself are she and her. What name and pronouns should we use when addressing you and referring to you? It's important for providers to use this type of an introduction with every resident, not just the ones who identify themselves as trans, since it's not obvious from looking at someone whether they're trans or not. If you hear a person of any gender identity or history refer to themselves in a way that you did not expect, check in with them about what the terms mean that they used, and then use those terms in your conversation with or about that individual. This mirroring is deeply affirming to the survivor since it indicates that you've been, um, you've heard what they've, they've said and you respect their self-definition. Shelters practices, shelter practices around client identification documents vary widely. If your shelter asks for identification, there are two key things to know about transgender men's documentation. First, the Department of Justice's Frequently Asked Questions document is clear. Shelters cannot require trans men to either produce more documents than other residents must provide or ask them about their anatomy or medical history. Second, when a trans man presents his identification documents, his document documentation markers, for example, the name or gender on his driver's license, birth certificate, or other document identification may or may not align with his gender identity or visual appearance. Remember that it's likely that the trans man, men that you work with may not have documentation that aligns with their name or gender. 
49 percent of trans people do not have ID that with their preferred name, and 67 percent do not have ID with their correct gender. Bottom line is that a person's gender is what they say it is. We know that all shelters work incredibly hard to create environments that are safe as possible for all shelter residents. The Department of Justice's Frequently Asked Questions document specifically addresses transgender victims and the issues of safety in their written guidance. They note that placement should be made, quote, on a case-by-case -case basis, whether a particular housing assignment would ensure that the victim's health and safety. Also, the DOJ FAQs say a victim's own views with respect to personal safety deserve serious consideration. The shelter should ensure that its services do not isolate or segregate victims based on actual or perceived gender identity. Trans survivors may have additional layers of concern regarding their safety. It may extend beyond safety from their abusive partner. Some of the concerns that he might have about entering shelter could include he might be worried that he will not have adequate bodily privacy, like Lurie mentioned before, with things like bedrooms and changing or showers. He may think that information about his gender history or his body or name or medications will be disclosed without his consent. He also may fear that he will be assaulted or harassed or discriminated against because of his transgender status or history, including being treated as though he's not really a man or being challenged about if he's man enough. Proactively helping survivors who are trans men understand the culture and expectations of your agency, as well as addressing their specific concerns, will be essential in, in making sure that they feel as comfortable as possible, will be treated with respect, and will be as safe as possible while in shelter. Fully discussing rooming options with trans men is critical for them to be able to voice any concerns and for staff and survivor to jointly make placement decisions that will result in the best outcome for the survivor. Shelter staff should discuss and problem solve potential issues with trans with a trans man if either side has concerns about his safety. Many concerns can be addressed with a little pre-planning. If, on the other hand, your shelter is not a viable or safe option, keeping in mind the VAWA non-discrimination condition, which mandates that agencies ensure that a trans men are not treated in a discriminatory way, agencies may help trans men find other housing options away from their abusers. This can include providing extended duration hotel vouchers, transitional housing, or brainstorming non-communal shelter housing options, as long as the alternative solutions are comparable in terms of safety, benefits, and duration of stay. Let's talk next about privacy and confidentiality. Confidentiality is obviously an important um, issue in, in all shelters and in working with any survivor. The VAWA confidentiality provision is a very clear is very clear that providers may not release any information about survivors without written consent. Shelter staff are accustomed to maintaining strict confidentiality and privacy of shelter residents. It's easy to forget that some pieces of personal information should also fall under this confidentiality practice. Transgender issues may be new to trans uh, to shelter staff, and and they may forget which of those components may fall under the confidentiality provisions. Assuring new residents that their personal information will be kept confidential is also a critical step in building trust, showing respect, and empowering them to take back some of the control over what information is shared or not shared about them. A man's transgender identity or history is inherently covered under VAWA's confidentiality provision. It can be helpful to consider this information as being akin to a medical condition. If you would, wouldn't would share what medication a resident is taking or what um, medical condition they might have, you also wouldn't want to share um, somebody's transgender history or transgender status. For some men, being trans is part of their identity. For others, it's simply a part of their past. A man may be open 
openly discussing his trans status or history with the majority of people or, uh, in his life, or he may closely guard this information, disclosing to only a select few. In some cases, people of trans history may not have disclosed their uh, trans status with their children or relatives or, or key people in their lives. If a trans man has shared his trans history with you, be certain you have his explicit permission to bring up his history if you have a joint conversation with his family or friends or with other service providers, including other shelter staff. The following is a short list of things that should always remain confidential unless otherwise agreed to with a resident. So their gender identity or their gender history um, it should be confidential around their documentation details, which would include their name, sex, or other information that might be on a driver's license or other paperwork. Their bodily configuration or surgical status. It's important to keep confidential the medications that they're on, both hormones and other prescriptions. And confidentiality also applies to things like prosthetics or gender-affirming items or devices that help maintain a, a person's masculine appearance. The survivor should be the person who shares any of this information with others, including other staff, unless if he explicitly asks for your help in ensuring that other residents and staff know that he's a man or knowing that he's trans. Remember, others may not readily know that a man is trans based on his appearance. If you believe that there's an, a need to disclose to another staff member, discuss the need with a survivor first before proceeding, if at all possible. In most cases, other agency staff do not need to know unless it's directly relevant to the support or services that the survivor is accessing. Keep in mind that accidental or intentional disclosing a person's trans status or history without consent not only violates confidentiality, it may also place a trans man at increased risk of unequal treatment, discrimination, and even violence from others. It's incumbent upon providers to make sure this does not happen and to protect trans men from, from such an occurrence, which might severely impact his safety. If a resident or other staff asks about someone else's trans history or status, it's critical to keep in mind the privacy rights of all residents within the shelter. All questions about residents' privacy or confidentiality information should be handled on, in parallel ways. For example, it might be a shelter's policy to say, we consider the personal information of all residents to be private information. It's up to each resident to determine how much information about their past or present they choose to share, if any. Some people may be more assertive and ask very personal questions or say certain statements like, Jack has breasts. These questions or statements may need a stronger response, reminding the person that it's not appropriate to ask about anyone's genitals or medical history. We're going to share with you three very different case examples that highlight some of what we've discussed already, as well as bringing in some new concepts for you to think about. And Lori's going to start with our first case. Charles is a physically disabled man of trans history. He has used an electric wheelchair for the past 20 years and lived in a fully accessible ranch-style house with his partner. Charles lives in a community without widespread public transportation. He is unable to drive, and his partner has controlled his access to medical and social services throughout the past seven years. While his partner was away on a two-week business trip, Charles was able to call an advocate who came to his home. They created a safety plan, which included obtaining legal documents to the couple's shared property and bank accounts, as well as a plan for shelter. The advocate shared that they had recently opened their shelter to serving both women and men. They were pleased to now offer services to people of all genders, and in the redesign of their shelter, each person had a single room with a shared bathroom. Women were housed on the main floor of the building, and men had the second floor. In their remodeling, they also installed up-to-date security systems with a key pass entry unique to each floor. They had one fully ADA acceptable, accessible room 
and bathroom on the main floor. The advocate soon recognized that there were no accessible rooms on the men's floor. The shelter had a firm no exceptions policy that only women would be housed on the first floor and men on the second. We're not going to go further in this case example. There are several ways that Charles could access shelter, even though there are some administrative and structural roadblocks in his way. For example, the shelter could decide that their policy of strict gender division doesn't need to be so rigid, especially since everyone has their own bedroom with a shared bathroom, and the accessible room has its own bathroom. Another solution would be to connect with a shelter in a nearby community that is fully wheelchair accessible and serves people of all genders. Michael will do case number two. So case number two is about Jack. Jack is a man's man sort of guy. He works as a firefighter. He's lived in an upstate, uh, very small community for the past five years. He loves his community and has developed many close friendships and with the other men that he works with, um, as well as through many uh, pickup sports games and the church that he attends and is very actively involved with. He is charismatic and well-loved in his community. Although his community is very small, it's also incredibly progressive. It has the only shelter in the state that housed um, that houses both women and trans people. So to be clear, the, the shelter houses both trans and non-trans women, as well as non-binary individuals and trans men. They have made a choice to not house non-transgender men at this point. Jack called the Family Violence Agency, who operates the shelter. He was in need of immediate shelter, and staff informed him that their shelter was progressive, but only housed women and transgender people. Since everyone knew everyone in their small community, he was unsure of what to do next. No one knew that he was trans, and he really needed shelter. He was in a, really, he was in a very serious uh, physical danger if he stayed at home with his partner. He needed out, and he needed safe housing right now. He knew that the people who worked at the shelter, including the partner, um, was partner of one of his coworkers. So he quickly concluded that um, you know, this was he was not willing to take the risk of coming out as trans in order to access shelter. The risks of disclosing that he were, was trans were just too great for him, greater than the risk of staying at home with his partner. He knew that if he entered the shelter for women and trans people, everyone would know that he was trans. As a firefighter, he had to trust that his coworkers had his back. If any of them knew he was trans, he feared that he could literally lose his life on the job. So he made the, the choice to stay in his abusive relationship. Um, Dylan, our, our third case study, is a trans guy living in San Francisco. He just moved to the Bay Area to move in with his partner, Dylan just started transitioning and was feeling uncomfortable and awkward, especially when socializing and connecting with people in gendered settings, like the BDSM play parties or the out-to-brunch gatherings his partner liked to attend. When he was finally able to reach out to one of San Francisco's domestic violence agencies, they shared with him many different shelter options. They openly talked about his trans identity, his few months into transition state, and the fact that he was often misread as female in some of the male places he attended, or as male in some of the places where more women dominated. As the advocate was sharing options for housing, Dylan realized that he was really concerned, concerned most about his ability to be consistently perceived as one gender, as either male or female, and that made him vote feel both uncomfortable and unsafe. The advocate was eager to tell him about how their agency had, has worked hard over the past 15 years to strengthen ties with the F2M community and how so many trans men were actively involved on their agency's board of directors, as hotline workers, and as volunteers at events. Over those 15 years, the trans male community and this agency had developed some systems of providing in-community shelter for cases just like Dylan's. 
there were five safe houses that were local collectives, homes where a dozen people were living, sharing meals together, were openly trans and queer, and who had house members who had participated in the DV agency's training program on maintaining physically and emotionally safe environments. Many of the house members had completed 40-hour advocate trainings as well. The advocate and Dylan recognized this was the perfect sheltering choice for him. He would stay in one of the collectives and would receive group support and other services at one of the shelters. He would be able to connect with other survivors, but also feel less vulnerable about his gender by living in the collective with other trans community members. We're going to shift now from case examples to how shelters can confront bias and create environments of deeper respect. Fully including transgender men into a shelter for the first time can require shifting the attitudes of shelter staff, not just changing rules, policies, and procedures. This cultural shift can take dedicated, consistent, and compassionate work, but in the end it results in a better experience for everyone and addresses issues of inclusion that go far beyond gender. Both staff and residents may hold biased beliefs and exhibit discriminatory or disrespectful behaviors. Bringing a diverse group of people together who all have different backgrounds and beliefs can be challenging under ideal situations. It is even more difficult when people are brought together because they are coming out of high-stress situations, such as those that make seeking shelter necessary. Some may have had little experience with relationships built on mutual respect. The majority will have had little previous contact with trans individuals. Often, even those who are trans themselves may not know other trans people. In order to help reduce the cycle of abuse, it is vital that shelters foster a culture of respect and wholeness for all people. One of the best techniques for creating a culture of respect and wholeness is to make sure people are informed ahead of time by reminding all survivors that your shelter serves people of many backgrounds and identities, including people of many religions, ages, sexualities, and disabilities, as well as transgender people. This can be done during the initial intake and or when screening survivors over the phone or when they first arrive. One all-gender shelter told us we let people know upon intake that there will be trans people and non-trans men in shelter, and we serve LGBTQ clients, and each person needs to think about that before they enter shelter. Then staff can refer back to that conversation if there's a problem. Fortunately, most shelter staff are well-practiced at supporting environments that are respectful and confronting bias when it occurs. Although staff may not have had much experience confronting bias around transgender issues specifically, the processes are the same as other areas of bias where there is an exhibited lack of respect or information. Both trans and non-trans men in shelter may use words and behaviors that are biased in different ways. Abusive, aggressive, or inappropriate behavior can happen by anyone against anyone Shelters need to have firm policies in place regarding how they maintain an environment free from violence. Shelters should also have clear policies on how to handle bias, harassment, and discrimination that specifically cover both sexual orientation and gender identity, whether actual or perceived. People can be subjected to harassment or violence simply because they are perceived to be trans or gay even if they don't identify as either. These policies should be in writing, and all staff should receive training to both familiarize themselves with the policies and to be prepared to uphold them. Non-discrimination policies should be visibly posted in the shelter and or a copy given to every resident so each person is aware that discrimination will not be tolerated. Procedures for consistently enforcing policies should also be in place, again, with staff fully trained on both the expected behavior of staff and the expected behavior of residents. When working with survivors who might be biased 
against or lack understanding of trans men, it can be helpful to focus on the commonalities between them to diffuse tense situations and reduced biased comments and behavior. For example, both individuals are in shelter because they need safety and a place to live. Interactions to resolve biased behavior do not necessarily need to be lengthy or punitive. Responding promptly to biased behavior, having a dialogue with each person involved, and coming to an agreement around future expected behavior can often be enough to stop the cycle of disrespect or abusive behavior. Actually modeling respectful behavior towards trans individuals in all aspects of your organization is just as important as having clear non-discrimination policies and procedures. When staff and residents treat each other with kindness, compassion, and respect, others will generally mirror those behaviors, which results in an environment that cultivates wholeness. A commitment is required from the very top to create an environment in which everyone is respected and feels secure enough to be fully themselves. That means the commitment has to be everywhere, every day. Every person must be respected from the board of directors, administrator, or executive director, and the shelter staff, hotline operators, and other staff and volunteers, to the kitchen and clean staff and the residents. This does not mean an agency has to discard hierarchies and chains of command. Rather, each person within the organization must respect and support the individuality of every other person. At this point, I'm passing it back to Michael to talk about other resources we have that may be able to help you. Great. Thanks, Lori. So as we wrap up today, um, like Lori said, we wanted to leave you with some resources and some reminders. So the first set of resources that we want to point out are some 101-based fact sheets. Um, we know that a lot of folks really prefer these very short and concise fact sheets, and we have many, many of them on our website for you. So a couple of examples of them are things like, who are trans people, a two-page fact sheet. Um, we have four fact sheets that are, are kind of unique to Forge's philosophy and theory. So one on the terms paradox, one on master status and how that relates to trans folks, one on know and tell why, and one on universal design. Those are kind of some interesting ways of presenting data that um, I think all of you know about but um, may find useful in a fact sheet. We also have fact sheets on uh, transgender rates of violence a fact sheet that's on safety planning with transgender clients. Um, we also have one that's on pronouns, like you'll see on the screen, that um, shares about how to conjugate pronouns and, and why pronouns are so important for folks. Um, we have other fact sheets that um, include some of the critically important issues um, in today's world, like um, background materials on anti-trans bathroom bills. Um, more related to shelter, we have um, eight very new tip sheets on shelter. So um, I won't tell you what eight, all eight of them are, but they, they break down very specific, concrete pieces of sheltering trans people. And um, again, most of them are, are two to three pages long, so very concise with very specific tips in each of them. We also have a safety planning tool that is transgender specific. And this tool is really useful. Um, tool that's been both used by transgender survivors and loved ones as well as victim service providers and shelter staff who are working with trans IPV survivors. So we encourage you to look at it and use it with uh, the trans clients that you're working with. We have three longer shelter documents that are in the process of being released, and um, they're mirroring these webinars. So one will be on trans men, like this webinar. Another will be on sheltering trans women. And the third longer document will be on sheltering non-binary individuals. So stay tuned for those in, in very early 2017. As we mentioned in the beginning of our time together, we have over 50 hours worth of archived webinars that are on our website. So all of them are trans-specific and focus in on specific types of victimization or a specific skill or a specific tool. For example, a few of them that you might be interested in are um, a webinar that's on safety planning, 
One is on working with survivors in rural communities. We know that many of you are in smaller communities or in rural communities. Um, another one of interest, um, specifically with the VAWA non-discrimination conditions, is a webinar specifically on the VAWA non-discrimination conditions. Um, we have webinars that are on um, policies that improve trans people's lives. Um, some other ones that might be interesting to folks on this webinar are um, trans people IPV in the legal system. And the last one to just to highlight for right now is uh, the power and control tactics specific to trans people webinar. And there are many, many more that you may find interesting and useful to your work. We welcome your questions and concerns and challenges and requests in the form of um, technical assistance requests and um, desire for having additional training. We're really happy to work with you on both small questions that might have a very, very quick and concise answer and um, working with larger questions that may take quite a while to resolve or work through. Um, no, no question is too small or too big to, to work with. You can uh, reach us through our website um, or by email or by phone, which is will be on the last slide. We wanted to do a couple of reminders as we wrap up today, because um, we know that you really want to work with, with trans men well, and, and there are some really simple ending reminders. Uh, the first is around name and pronoun, so we'd like, um, we all like to hear the name and pronoun that we identify with, and with trans clients it's especially important to do things like ask what name and pronouns and listen to what the answer is, and then use the name and pronouns that trans folks share with you. Plain and simply, trans men are men, and of course it's a little bit more complex than that, but um, you know, no two men are, are alike, but uh, Vanita Gupta really captured it well when she said that transgender men are men. They work, live, and study as men. When working closely with uh, trans men to determine the best option for shelter for them, keep in mind that services provided should be the same um, for all men and or should be comparable in terms of safety and therapeutic modality, geographic location, or other aspects of accessibility, characteristics of the facilities where services are provided, characteristics of individuals providing those services, as well as the same or similar um, things in terms of quality and duration. And the fourth reminder is that uh, every person um, being sheltered, every trans man is, is no more difficult uh, to shelter than any other survivor who needs housing. So every person brings a set of challenges and resiliencies, and working with trans men is, is indeed no harder or no easier than sheltering anyone else. And the last reminder, um, as many of you um, already do, is to intentionally create an environment of respect, which is so essential for survivors who have just come from abusive relationships. As you continue to create these spaces in your everyday work, both trans and non-trans survivors will benefit and feel supported. We're really glad that you joined us today, and we want to thank you for um, for being here with us, and we do welcome your continued uh, questions or comments, and um, feel free to reach out to us um, at the email address that's on the screen, which is askforge at forge-forward.org, or find us on our website, forge-forward.org. Um, thank you again for making a difference in the lives of the trans men who have experienced intimate partner violence.